Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And the texts for uh, this Sunday, January 10th, the baptism of our Lord are Genesis 1, 1 through 5, Psalm 29, Acts 19, 1 through 7, and Mark 1, 4 through 11. It is so good to be back in Mark, in the year of Mark. Well, that's an important observation, uh, Rolf, because we are now in Mark, the year of Mark. And so I think it's worth the time for the preacher to kind of orient themselves to the Markan world. And this is for, you know, this is really setting off uh, your preaching in Mark. And so you definitely need to add verses one through three uh, because, uh, because it is the beginning of Mark. And, you know, the beginning of the good news of, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, would also be a lovely connection to the fact that this is paired with the opening verses of Genesis. So there is this, there is this connection of, of what is this beginning and that, and that could be, uh, that could be a direction, a homiletical direction. And then the other thing is that, yes, of course, this is the baptism of our Lord. And I have a lot of things to say about uh, what does that mean in a time of a pandemic? What is, what is it? How do, how do we think about baptism and what were, what kinds of things could we do uh, to, uh, to, uh, to remember, acknowledge, affirm baptism uh, in, in our homes. But uh, I, uh, I, the, the one thing that I was um, thinking about is just to consider that this is, this is the opening scene of Mark, right? That this is, when you think about beginnings of gospels uh, and how each of the gospels begin, uh, that really is setting the tone for what is going to happen. It's the, it's the preamble. And what difference does it make that, you know, the, the very first thing that, that happens besides, you know, John in the, in the desert is the baptism of Jesus. How does that, how does that then shape uh, what we uh, what we are going to expect? How does that? Uh, what difference does that make for uh, for imagining who Jesus is and what Jesus is about? So before we kind of default to all of our baptism ritual and baptism language and what does baptism mean and you know quoting Luther's small catechism and stuff like that or whatever thing you think you want to quote. Uh, it, just to it, just to think about how how what this says about who Jesus is and uh, and what God is up to in Jesus that baptism this baptism ends up being that entry point into those questions. If I uh, jump in, uh, Caroline, um, Mark is a really short gospel that if uh, you ever have the chance to. Um, hear it all in one reading is really powerful. But uh, I know a couple of preachers who memorize their uh, the the text. Um, so rather than read it, they recite it. Um, and by recite it, I I don't mean to recite it kind of as a you know a da 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 da, but actually dramatically uh, perform it uh, if you want to want to say it that way, and uh, to set this up to set our introduction into the year of Mark, um, it is really powerful to begin with verse one and just recite uh, all the way through the reading for um, for this week. Uh, um, because you hear it so much differently when it is performed rather than merely read as a, as a broken off selection of the text. So I just wanted to come behind you and suggest that. There is on YouTube uh, several different versions of, uh, of the gospel of Mark performed. Uh, and uh, when I was part of a church that preached through the whole gospel of Mark, we often would use that uh, show show the um it goes it's chapter by chapter so i think he uh, i think the guy it's just him so it's one person one voice david rhodes david rhodes used to do it uh yeah it, but his is not the one that we used on on a website uh, mm -hmm. we used uh, 
one by the Fellowship for Performing Arts, but there's different versions of it. And I think it is, um, it is really powerful uh, mm -hmm. to do uh, in that way. So I, was, I just want to agree with Joy and let people know there are resources out there. So when I come to Mark 1 uh, and this passage, and uh, I don't know, Matt and Caroline, if you have the same experience, but our teacher, Don Jewell, um, loved this passage. And uh, especially the, 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 the image that um, as he was uh, coming up to the water, he saw the uh, heavens torn apart. And uh, then, th which led him to the phrase, God is on the loose. Uh, mm -hmm. That in Matthew, what, you know, Matthew's then recension of this text, the heavens open, but here they are torn apart, which then, of course, the inclusio at Mark where the curtain uh, in front of the temple and on one of the curtain temples was embroidered uh, an image of the heavens. So was torn apart at his death that in the event of Jesus Christ, God is on the loose. And let me point you one more time then to an artistic resource, uh, Peter Mayer, not the Peter Mayer I went to college with, who's got the song, you know, holy now, not that Peter Mayer, uh, my college uh, schoolmate, but Peter Mayer, uh, Jimmy Buffett's guitar player, he's got a song uh, about God on the loose. Um, I think it's called God is Loose in the World, uh, which he then wrote uh, about this, about that notion that in Jesus Christ, God will not stay distant from us, safely, uh, safely hemmed up in heaven uh, where we kind of want God to stay, actually, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the Bette Midler. I'm like Mr. Pop Culture from the 80s guy today, huh? <laughs> uh, if, hey, if you need any pop culture references that are no longer current, I'm your person. The uh, God is not at a distance, but God is yeah. on the loose in our face, um, stirring up trouble. Well, and that's, uh, you know, good news for some and not such good news for others. I mean, it depends on, you know, it's, it depends on how close you want God to be. And some it's of sort, us don't. Yeah, it's and sort of a long I, gospel thing. And I, yeah, and I, uh, I think, yes, I have wonderful memories of that. Another resource I would point, um, and I, I thank Matt for this, uh, that I've really found helpful uh, is the uh, book by uh, Blount and Charles called Preaching Mark in Two Voices. And they use some of the same language of talking about uh, Mark 110 as God's unruly behavior, that God runs loose through human history, through the ministry of Jesus, and that we are players in the same boundary breaking movement of God's imminent reign. And so that the implication here is not, not only about God and what God is up to in Jesus, but what is it going to mean to follow God or follow Jesus and uh, into this kind of, you know, ripping apart of, of, of boundaries. And of course, in Mark, there's all, all kinds of boundaries or borders that are, that are being crossed and being, you know, uh, being um, teared, torn down. So uh, that's, a, I think, another great, and, I, and Matt, Matt turned me on to that book, and it's been really helpful for me and doing some of the teaching I'm doing with Mark. I'm struck yeah. by verse, um, uh, uh, verse five, um, uh, and this um, is a, a twist on the idea of uh, uh, God on the loose uh, uh, in terms of what we've talked about uh, through this pandemic of the church has left the building. Um, one of the things that uh, in a negative way, uh, social media and opinion expression uh, over the uh, last, well, the last few years, but specifically the last year, has made me reach a verse five in a different way. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him. I had thought it not possible for a single individual in our current context to draw such attention of the mobs of people. And yet now reading this verse, it's not so much hyperbole, but it is a recognition that the one who was bearing witness to Jesus in the first century was drawing the attention of the whole 
community, the whole of the people. And, and for me, if I were preaching this, I would linger on what kind of testimony to God with us are we giving? Are we giving one that makes people, that, that invites people to be drawn to us and therefore our witness to God among us? Or uh, as it seems more, are we giving a witness that repels people from the gospel? I think there's a moment where we might, uh, as uh, the followers of Christ, want to be held accountable uh, to that truth telling uh, through this text. One of the things I think that's, that's helpful with that, and especially since this text falls on, on baptism of our Lord, is uh, to kind of dig a little bit deeper into what John's ministry looks like here and, and what's, what's taking place. And so some of that is kind of teaching. Like we'll, we'll get a sense from Acts 19 later on that what John's ritual is, is not Christian baptism as we understand it. At least not yet. Of course, there's connections. But but part of what John is doing with this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins is he's calling people to tell the truth. So the thing that's happening, right, verse five, they're confessing their sins, that this is the first aspect of this. So this moment that God has chosen for Jesus to um, receive a commissioning, receive the spirit uh, for the fabric of the universe to be literally altered, like Rolf and Caroline were talking about, is this moment of truth telling or is this moment of of the people of god or the all these people um being straight with themselves and with uh, with one with others about who they are and about what's real which which i really appreciate um especially now i i think truth always comes before reconciliation the truth and sec reconciliation aren't so much um paired things but they're sequential Brian Stevenson taught me that from Equal Justice Initiative. Um, that yeah, there's this moment of truth telling, and then this for Jesus and his own experience now becomes this uh, this moment of sending, this moment of of breakthrough. If I can do a quick self promotion, like three years ago, I wrote two pieces for Working Preacher called "Preaching Mark in a Time of Distress." I think they're called, and that kind of explores that a little bit more. And some of the blunt um, and and uh, Charles stuff as well comes into that. But I'd urge us to, to focus on the voice that then comes at the end. So on the one hand, this is about baptism and truth telling and what does confession mean and why is it so hard um, for us to do? But then this idea that Jesus' ministry starts with a divine voice or a divine word of some sort, which the Psalm will pick up on with Genesis 1 will pick up on uh, as well. And because you're gonna come back, we'll have a, an unfortunate detour into John next week, but then we come back to Mark oh. and we'll get more of these in-breaking kinds of stories. My heart. Unfortunate, not because it's John, but because it's a strange interruption of yeah of, yeah. of some mark and uh, momentum that we could have we could have gathered that, here. You I agree. I I agree. I'll, I will I'll can I will repent and seek forgiveness. Uh, I didn't mean to be a slight to John. I just we'll see I if we can reconcile. Uh, Only after I, the I, truth is told. But um, anyway. I think that I think that's important that we pay attention to uh, that those those kinds of details in the text. And I think another I, I think another detail is the importance of the location. That this all of this is happening in the wilderness, which is uh, all this this decentering of God's good news of God's presence uh, that God's that God's presence and and the good news of God is found on the edge, uh, and also belongs there. And God goes beyond these borders and boundaries of where we thought God was supposed to be. And I think there could be a lot of promise in that for people of thinking about. Uh, I, I really do, I've been thinking a lot about this and I really do think that we are in what I would call, I don't know if I, and I'm using crisis in a very particular way, but a theological and an ecclesial crisis. And by crisis, I'm, I'm meaning like a time of discernment or a time of, 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 of judging not in, not, in a, not in a negative way or an indicting kind of way, but of really discerning uh, who, who, what is God up to? How is God, how is God present? And where is God when we have 
so located God in our churches and the rituals and of our churches, uh, knowing theoretically that that's not where God is, but still counting on that. And, uh, and how, how we're navigating that in our preaching, I think is a really critical aspect. And this is one way to do that. Uh, and one way to, uh, I mentioned earlier it, it, when we got started, but even to think about how you might um, carry that into a sort of what kind of baptismal remembrance or affirmation might you invite people to do in their homes uh, to say, yeah, that is where, this is where God is. God is right there with you. Uh, and this is a text that, that shows us that. I appreciate that. Uh, one of the things that uh, the lectionary uh, a pairing doesn't do here, but uh, Rick E. Watts uh, has written a book that uh, highlights how um, the book is called uh, Isaiah's New Exodus in Mark. And what Watts does is he, um, he highlights how to truly understand Mark, you've got to understand um, uh, ancient Israel's reading of the Exodus that is located in the prophetic writings of Isaiah. And uh, in a sense, to be able to recognize this wilderness uh, um, draws uh, into the memory of the placement of the people uh, who need the promise of God among them. And this God is not going to be located in a temple. This God is going to be on the loose with them, to use the, the words of, of Don Jewell. Uh, so uh, I, I just uh, think that that would be another way to pay attention to the, what this uh, brings to memory for those who read Mark uh, from the Old Testament memories. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I, did, I, I was not aware of that. Um, sounds like a dissertation, uh, but it's, uh, I, I'm not aware uh, of that. But. And it's, 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 it's a tomb of a reading, but it's good work. <laughs> it's good work. <laughs> the... Um, in this little part of, of, of Mark, and I know we're really um, spent a lot of time on the gospel text, but um, so many Old Testament passages are in the background of this. Um, of course, there is, um, who is John? You know, John is the, the figure of Elijah at the end of Malachi. So the way that one ordering of the Old Testament, um, you got to remember when, when you've got a bunch of scrolls lying around, the idea of order, um, you haven't sewn them together in a book yet, uh, in a folio. So the, the idea of order is a little anachronistic, but, but the Christian then order, which probably preserves one of the earlier Jewish orders, um, ends with the promise uh, in Malachi that uh, I will send my messenger, I will send John the Baptist, uh, and so then you get the the imagery of what John is wearing is what Elijah wears. But then, you know, even the reference you were mentioning, uh, uh, Joy, uh, Judah and Jerusalem, the, the, the off, it says then in Malachi 3, the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing in those days. And uh, so you, uh, and then of course, the words that Matt's talked about quoting from Psalm 2, which was a messianic text by this point, probably the reason it's appended to the front of the Psalter like that is so that the Psalter would be read as a book of messianic prophecy. Um, you are my son, the beloved with you, I am pleased. And so, so, you know, so Malachi three and four, second Kings two uh, with John the Baptist, Psalm two, um, and all that stuff um, just to understand what's going on here makes a good Bible study, probably not a great sermon, but it's just good to have it in, in one's head as one tries to understand uh, what's happening here in this uh, first gospel. I, th I think it can be a good sermon. I mean, I appreciate you pulling that out, Rolf, because it's, you don't want this Sunday to become, I don't think you want this Sunday to become, Jesus was baptized just like us to show how much he loved us. Um, you don't want this to be, Jesus was baptized so we would know how to do it. You don't, um, you want to say that in this story is his own, well, I'll, I'll do this. I don't usually do this when I teach it, but to drop some some systematics on it, I mean that Jesus presents himself to John for repentance, for the forgiveness of sins. Now that might mess with our theologies in some ways, but he does a very human thing like everybody else is doing. But then he's told, he's commissioned by this voice that is a voice of 
um, of power. He's named by this voice, right? He, he's, I, I can't say the word adoption because then the heresy police will come after me, but he's, he's identified as God's own in this moment and then literally possessed by God's own spirit in this moment. So the, the amount of humiliation and power, like all mixed together in this scene, I think you can kind of give people a sense for that by pulling in some of those Old Testament yeah. echoes so that we get a sense, oh my goodness, this is like the most electric scene. And Mark is indicating, you know, look out, the entire nature, the entire fabric of creation has been altered as a result of this story. Um, and you'll see that in the coming weeks in terms of what does that look like and still provokes the question of what do we Christians do with that when the world looks pretty ordinary from most people's line of vision. but. Maybe I'm just saying stuff that's been said uh, already, but I don't know. We probably don't need to apologize for not spending a lot of time with Genesis 1 and Psalm 29 because, I mean, those will be texts that come into the service of talking about the baptism of Jesus, I assume. But they're both passages that each in their it's, it's each in its own way talks about God's voice, not just as conversational or revealing, but as a means of God's power in the world. And bringing things about, um, and yeah. I think that's that's true. Mm -hmm. Well, Genesis is there not only because of God's voice. So you get like his, you know, right? You get God's voice in Mark, and you get God speaking here, but also because it's the heaven and the earth, which then the heaven and the earth, you know, the heavens are torn apart. So, and there's water involved as well. So usually, uh, when there's so water in a text, it means about baptism. Yeah. <laughs> not this. So in this case, you it see does water. in Mark. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would not myself have paired Psalm 29 with, um, well, really with anything, uh, but certainly not with the baptism. But I mean, I, Psalm 2 would make a better choice where the quotation comes from. Um, this is, uh, but just a word about it. Um, you know, this is uh, really a Psalm about, I think, having that being out in nature, first of all, I mean, right, because this is a nature psalm, um, and a thunderstorm rolling in, and just having one of those moments in nature of, of overwhelming sense of the holiness, or in this case, the glory of God. Uh, one of one of the one of the great joys of life is is if one has great neighbors. And uh, at the lake where my parents uh, have a little cabin, we have great neighbors. Our neighbor next door is Gary. Gary probably never thought he would uh, be mentioned on Sermon Brainwave because he doesn't know it exists. Uh, but Gary is a real outdoors person. And he tells me all these stories about like being in the woods and being out there and just, then having this overwhelming sense from time to time of God's presence and the, and the glory of God uh, like, you know, when he just sees, you know, cobwebs all around him and notices it because the sun hits them perfectly. Uh, that's that. That's what the psalm is about, I think. But Matt, I know you had a question about it. Oh, I was just wondering, uh, the word ascribe is not one that's in my daily uh, vocabulary, but um, yeah, it just, it's more than just, than just concede or something like that right it there's something give is what the word means um give glory to god you know that we use that uh we use that all the time so you know give uh give glory to god what does that mean you don't god doesn't need us to give glory. yeah it does when we praise god and say you know god uh that sense god's all around us god's right here give glory i don't use the word ascribe either nor do i think of um Syrian jumping like a young wild ox very often. <laughs> I think we would have cause to worry. But, uh, but again, you know, this idea of, of divine communication that, that, needs, that we should talk, that people should reflect on a little bit, right? To speak of Jesus as word of God or to speak of God as one who has a word or who has a voice, that there's something about the Old Testament's uh, depictions of God that are about are, that are always communicative, right? About a God who's never satisfied being alone, uh, but of a God who's uh, but whose voice is also 
um, usually a frightful thing or a powerful thing. Of course, Elijah experiences it differently. Um, but what that what that means to think of is this the voice of God present in your own baptism in some way, shape or form. Uh, can I say one more thing related to that? Please. Well, now I, I'm not to, I'm not the rule maker. You go ahead. Yeah, pretty much now you have to say yes uh, by the rules of the <laughs> podcast, right? Um, a whole other direction that you, you signal, Matt, is just, you know, how words do things. Uh, and of course, uh, J.L. Austin's famous book, How to Do Things with Words, that words don't just describe, uh, uh, but words can actually create actions. You know, um, the naming of something, the giving of a, of a bad nickname to somebody, you know, think back if you've ever were given a terrible nickname in junior high that stuck, that hurt. But, um, you know, the naming things, cr uh, creating a bet, like if we say, I bet you, you know, this, yes, it's a bet. I mean, words can do things. Um, forgiving somebody does that. I forgive you or, or reconciling. Um, uh, my mom recently died. Uh, and uh, the, one of the things that we had to do, you know, is um, tell her it was okay to go. And, you know, so one of the last things that my dad did was, you know, just pray with her and, and, you know, we love her, thank you and say, it's okay to go. And then shortly after that, she did, you know, that, that, that words can have these amazing power uh, for harm, but also for healing and for blessing. Uh, and uh, that's a, just to, to remember, that's what we're doing in our sermons. Uh, that's what we're doing in our liturgy. The performative nature of words, especially the words of God, which I really appreciate you highlighting, Ralph, throughout this, is that um, um, what is spoken, what is said, causes, creates, makes happen. And as you said, our words can make happen bad, or we can be intentional so that our words make happen glimpses of the light and presence of God among us bringing hope in the midst of the horror. I'm just gonna keep on homiletically repeating that. Okay, so maybe a couple words on acts. I, I absolutely love the question in verse two, and that would totally be my sermon uh, if I were gonna uh, choose acts. No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. There's a Holy Spirit, seriously? Like really? I just, I would just totally play that up. I love that question. And then um, inviting people um, into like, have you heard that there's a Holy Spirit? And this is what the Holy Spirit does. I mean, going back to some of your comments, uh, Matt, about, about the power of, of Jesus being possessed by the Spirit. And, uh, and so, yeah, I just... I, I just think that is such a great line. And uh, I think we've all been in some worship services that have made us say that line <laughs> about certain congregations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, is there a Holy Spirit? Yeah. So anyway, that's, I just think that's a fabulous question and I would run with that and just, and, but then to bring it to, uh, to, to connect it to baptism and say, that, yeah, this the the Holy Spirit is is integral to uh, what happens at baptism, and uh, and so how how is it that we both confess the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, and then that then also imagine uh, if for our own lives, but also imagine how do we do that uh, for the sake of others, and imagining other people asking us this question, like wait, there's a Holy Spirit, and then you say yeah, there is. Let me tell you what what she's up to. She's up to some pretty amazing stuff, and so I just think it. I I I love it. 